Welcome everyone to this uh, event um, and today we are visited by two very prominent uh, persons. But uh, my name is Folke Tashman and I'm going to chair uh, the event. Uh, and before I introduce them, uh, I would like Staffan to say a few words about the context, the, the project uh, in which this takes place. So, hello. Uh, I just wanted to give a brief uh, background that uh, this is a, a result of a, a visit that we made uh, a group in February in Washington where we met Cynthia and uh, it's a part of uh, the artistic research at the Institute uh, and uh, we had a co collaboration Helena Hammarskjöld and Fredrik, uh, Jorgen and Fredrik and me uh, with uh, the lab at Georgetown University where you also work. So as a result of that week, we had workshops and meetings. We invited you to come here. So we're really happy to have you here. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, so our guests are Cynthia Schneider, uh, who's sitting here, and Carl Tam, uh, both uh, uh, former ambassadors, uh, which means I think that they will get along fine, uh, diplomats <laughs> as they are. <laughs> Uh, and I will begin with <laughs> Cynthia, whose career, I have to say, is extraordinarily impressive. She started out as an art scholar with a PhD from Harvard, focusing on Dutch painters and uh, perhaps especially Rembrandt. She then worked as a diplomat in the Netherlands and this knowledge, this familiarity with the Dutch culture and Dutch painting helped her to persuade the Dutch to come on board with the project, uh, uh, what's it called now, something like in the movie, Joint Strike Fighter, and oh. persuaded them to, to, to purchase it eventually. And for these efforts, uh, she was awarded the highest uh, uh, honor uh, that Pentagon can award. Um, so that's in itself uh, sort of astonishing. And he ma she managed to do this by partly by organizing a shared viewing of a movie. So culture uh, means something. After that, she has been involved in all sorts of very interesting projects uh, all across the globe, I have to say. Uh, for example, in Africa, the Timbuktu Renaissance, and I urge you to look, look it up uh, on the web, so because Thanks. her long CV is, is too yeah. long for me yes. to stand here and uh, recapitulate uh, uh, and so on. So, so I'm not going to do th that. She's going to give the pres uh, presentation. And then we have Carl Tam, who also has a very long and illustrious career. I mean, that's the problem with these... Uh, prominent people, you know, they, they have done so many things, you can't talk about all of them, but perhaps we could mention that Carl has been uh, uh, the Minister of uh, Education for a few years, and in that capacity he uh, made important efforts to fast-track gender equality in, in academia, and we are all very grateful for that, of course, although the problem of gender equality is something we are still uh, struggling with. So uh, the way this is going to work is as follows. Cynthia is going to give her presentation, then I give the word to Carl, and hopefully we get some back and forth, and after that I will invite uh, uh, questions from the audience. So please, Cynthia, and let's give her an applause. Thank you so much, and um, thank you also for not reading my CV, that was <laughs> deadly. Um, so I'm, first of all, so sorry. I have absolutely no sense of directions, but I'm pretty good at following directions, which led me into just a completely different place. So I, I really apologize. You all got up so early. I, I'm so sorry to keep you waiting. Um, what we're looking at here is actually one of the original productions of the Laboratory for Global Performance and Politics, and I bring greetings to our Swedish friends from my co-director, Derek Goldman, who is a professor of theater. The Laboratory for Global Performance and Politics is an unique, I think, interdisciplinary organization uh, located both in Georgetown School of Foreign Service and College of Arts and Sciences, and our mission is humanizing global politics through 
the power of performance. And I'm going to be talking a lot about humanizing politics. This is our one-person show starring uh, Academy Award-nominated actor David Strathairn about the life of Jan Karski, a uh, Holocaust witness, and then a uh, Georgetown faculty member. <coughs> this is the theme of this talk and really all the work I do in my life. This is something that Wole Soyinka, the no a Nigerian Nobel laureate, said at the first and only White House conference on cultural diplomacy. He was talking then in the year 2000 about conflict in the Middle East, suggesting that if we focused a little more on culture and a little less on politics, we might make more headway. Uh, unfortunately, we certainly haven't done that, but it's still a good idea. Um, I'm sure you all are familiar with all of these terms, possibly not the term sharp power. That's a relatively new term coined by NED, the National Endowment for Democracy in Washington. And what sharp power means is basically autocratic governments think particularly Russia and China, using tools we associate with soft power, media, education, to further their purposes and goals. Um, and I'm going to be uh, talking about soft power, but emphasizing to you that uh, it is a two-way street. You can't just do soft power. You have to be a model, be an example, be admired, and be a force of attraction. Now, given what goes on in the world today, you would think that hard power, particularly military power, is the only thing that brings about real change. It seems to be pretty much the only thing my country resorts to. But I think that's wrong. Think about how you actually lead in the world. And I think it's astonishing that basically right after World War II, long before Joseph Nye thought about the term soft power, uh, this appeared in an editorial in a Chinese newspaper. And I think the distinction is so important. If the United States merely wants to dominate the world, the atomic bomb and the U.S. dollar will be fine to do that. If the United States wants to lead the world, it must have a kind of moral superiority in addition to military superiority. I mean, moral superiority, that sounds kind of awful these days. But the point is, it must be a model. It must model the behavior it's talking about. It can't just talk about it, and it can't just impose it. So... What can soft power do? What's the biggest change that anyone has experienced in the last 100 years? It's the fall of the Berlin Wall and the breakup of the Soviet Union. That did not happen through hard power. Yes, there were treaties. Yes, there were arms buildups. But those were not what made millions of people across Eastern Europe and the then Soviet Union say, enough. We won't put up with this anymore. And I'm going to now show you a trailer of a film called Free to Rock, which shows one aspect of the song You're waiting for the bomb to drop. So let me just make a couple of points about this concept. Um, first of all, this was, of course, not a government program. I will talk about um, government-sponsored music programs that came previously. Those were the jazz musicians sent around the world by the U.S. government. But rock and roll was private. Um, and, one of the, and, and in one case, this is one of the great miscalculations of all time, the, East, uh, the government of East Berlin was sick and tired of its citizens going to the wall, listening to concerts that were taking place in West Berlin. And in West Berlin, they were 
pushing the speakers towards East Berlin so they could hear. And so the government of East Berlin thought, okay, we're going to give them one big concert and then that'll be enough. And so they invited Bruce Springsteen, who went and was, I must say, a great ambassador and learned German and spoke, you know, said, you know, hello, I'm here and I'm here. Um, rock and roll to Spelen. You know, he said, I'm, I'm here to play rock and roll and not to do politics. 300,000 people came to the concert. It was in July of 1989 and needless, uh, July of 1988, but needless to say, that was not the end of it. Um, but the rock and roll, the American rock and roll musicians who came were important, but I hope you noticed there were also Soviet, Latvian, you know, Hungarian rock musicians in these countries. And they were the ones who were really spreading the music all the time. Uh, and in the beginning of these concerts, the um, Soviet guards wouldn't allow people to get out of their seats. They had to sit and listen like this. And finally, they were able to get up. So, I mean, it was literally a liberating step by step. I should add that it also takes the right leader. You know, if, if Putin uh, and not Gorbachev had been in charge, he probably would have just shot all the people going to the concert. So it's, it's a combination of things. But I do think the ideas and the music uh, coming from the West and then seeding the music that was already there in these countries made a huge difference. And before the rock and roll musicians went, we had, of course, the jazz musicians um, traveling all over the world. Here's Dizzy Gillespie in Pakistan um, <laughs> seducing a snake, getting it to come out of the basket. Um, and what was Miss Dizzy playing? What was so interesting about the black musicians was that they were traveling at the time, the 50s, the 60s, still in the 60s, when in the United States, they very often were not even allowed into the door, the front door of the theaters where they were playing. They weren't allowed into the restaurant next door. They weren't allowed into the hotel across the street. And yet, the U.S. government is sending them as official emissaries. Uh, and this is a quote from Dizzy Gillespie, who was invited before one of these tours to come into the State Department for a briefing. And this is what he said. I don't need you to tell me what America is. I know what America is. I live it. And, of course, he was sent anyway. So the purpose of these jazz tours were not, of course, for them to give speeches. But if anyone asked them what their life was like in the United States, they were totally honest about it. And they also insisted on democratizing their concerts. Very often they were set up to play in, you know, like the Royal Dramatin or some major theater um, for the elites. And they said, we won't do that unless you also add free concerts. So they literally embodied uh, the values they were representing. And it wasn't just the jazz musicians. This is what a writer who visited the Soviet Union said, that you know, somewhat ironically, you don't convince people about freedom of expression by talking about it. And I, I think people still don't understand this. <laughs> but if you go as a representative of the U.S. government and you criticize that government and speak freely about it, well, then you don't need to trumpet freedom of expression. You are doing it. And for people who live in a country where you'd be thrown in jail for doing that, it makes an impression. So these artists were literally embodying in every sense um, the freedom and democracy that they were meant to represent. Another thing that was happening at this time is the wars over civil rights were being fought in the United States. And while the internet certainly didn't exist, there was television. 
And so again, while this is the height of the Cold War, the United States is talking all about how we represent freedom and democracy. Meanwhile, around the world are going these images of what is happening in the United States. The young one of the young nine teenagers who integrated Little Rock High School in Arkansas after the Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954. James Meredith, the first black person to attend the University of Mississippi. They couldn't, they weren't safe. They were, look at this poor young woman being verbally assaulted by adult women. It's just horrifying. And James Meredith required a whole phalanx of U.S. Marshals to protect him. And, you know, these weren't the worst images. There was the Selma Bridge and blacks being beaten. So you're hearing one thing from the U.S. government and then you're seeing something totally different that's actually happening there. And this loop uh, had an influence on the civil rights legislation in the United States. Ambassadors and other Americans traveling abroad were calling the White House and saying, this is killing us. We, you have got to fix this. This is completely unacceptable. You know, nonetheless, at, at this time during the Cold War, the United States could stand for freedom and democracy in Eastern Europe, even as the same government was responsible for undermining elections and worse uh, in Latin America, in Iran, in Africa, and both were possible because people didn't know. People in one place didn't know what was happening in the other place. That's not possible anymore. So today, when you have the horrors that everyone is seeing every day going on in Gaza, it dramatically affects the United States' soft power. And it doesn't matter, you, you can hold as many democracy conferences as you want. When people are confronted with the images that they're seeing in Gaza, they don't believe it. I personally don't think that this government could hold another democracy conference in the State Department. I don't think they could do it. I don't think people would come. Uh, and this is something that has changed with the current environment for diplomacy with social media, 24-7 news, citizen journalism. You know, everything is visible to everyone all the time. Not all of it's true, of course, but nonetheless, actions are made visible all the time. So you have people saying things like, where are the American values that the admi Biden administration has been talking about since it came to power? So you can't do both anymore. And um, quite frankly, I think this just may be difficult for mm -hmm. someone of President Biden's age to understand. I mean, he uses TikTok for his campaign and all that, but that's not the same thing as really getting that you are being judged every day by the global population and also getting the true meaning of soft power, which is it just, it doesn't matter what, what you say and what you say you stand for. If your actions violate that, no one's gonna listen to you. So we're operating in a very different kind of environment than happened during the Cold War. Uh, and in this environment, I think, first of all, listening is more important than ever and so is culture so are stories you know in many autocratic uh, regimes artists are able to say things that political scientists aren't because as uh, one of my uh, Iranian friends a filmmaker said censors don't get allegory so you can get away with criticizing the government and the regime in a way that you couldn't if you publish an op-ed. 
Um, I'm, I'm going to also suggest another form of soft power, not just presenting things about yourself, but actually using your capacity, and this applies equally to Sweden as the United States, as uh, India, Brazil, any, any country really with capacity um, to produce creative expression. I think it's more valuable even than presenting your own artists, your own ideas. What's more valuable is using your capacity to leverage local voices to enable local voices who, who don't need, you know, they don't need American hip hop artists to go there. They've got their own fantastic artists, but those artists often aren't able to have concerts before their own public because they don't have the money, they don't have the production capacity, they don't know how to do marketing, all these things. Those are ways um, that other countries' people can be helpful. I want to give you what I think is a really powerful example of soft power. And again, I think we, we think of this in a government context. So often it happens, it's not at all intended to be that. And I think uh, John Stewart and The Daily Show is a great example of soft power. Um, do you all remember The Daily Show? Did you watch it here? Yeah. 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 <laughs> He's back, I know, Monday nights. Um, and he, he had influence all over the world, but particularly on the Egyptian surgeon-turned-comedian Bassem Youssef, uh, who had the most popular television show in the Middle East. So here is Bassem giving a tribute to Jon Stewart when Jon Stewart was awarded the Mark Twain Prize for humor at the Kennedy Center a year ago. So that is soft power, and it doesn't have to have anything to do with the government. Uh, and sometimes, as we'll see, it can even be at odds um, with the government. As Bassem mentioned, this was done after he now lives in Los Angeles, as you probably know, virtually everyone who was involved in the Egyptian revolution is out of the country now or in prison, a large number in prison. Uh, so he's in Los Angeles now, but uh, when he was still, uh, when he still had his show under uh, President Mohamed Morsi, he was brought in for questioning. And on that night, uh, John Stewart devoted his monologue to Basra. <laughs> So I, I do want to emphasize that Bassem under President Morsi was brought in for questioning, and that was it. It was under President Sisi who took power shortly afterwards, in the beginning of July 2013, in a coup. Uh, then uh, he was harassed, his family was threatened, and he had to leave the country. So this episode of... Um, the Daily Show, which you saw part of, um, was then tweeted out by a member of the public affairs staff at the U.S. Embassy in Cairo, which in my view is simply doing your job. He didn't say the truth about Mohamed Morsi or anything like that. It just said, the Daily Show talks about Egypt. Might have said talks about Bassem Yusuf with the link. And the Muslim Brotherhood official Twitter account then responded to this tweet from the U.S. Embassy and said, you shouldn't put out this kind of propaganda. You know, this is outrageous. I happened to be in Berlin when this was all happening, so I saw it happen in real time. Uh, and so then what? So you've, you've given out information that this program, which, you know, you could say was critical of President Morsi. You could say also that it represents pretty much everything America stands for, um, was tweeted out that it existed. The official Egyptian government responds, we don't like that, it's propaganda, it's terrible. What do you do then at the embassy? Uh, in my view, nothing. <laughs> you just 
tough luck. The government doesn't always like what you do. But that was not the response of the U.S. ambassador at the time. She told her staff to take down their Twitter account, to close the Twitter account. And I'm sure people in her staff, this is again another generational issue, um, said, no, no, that's not a good idea. You can't really do that. But uh, she insisted, and so this is what appeared um, if you went to the U.S. Embassy in Cairo Twitter account. This is back in the days when it was Twitter and lots of people were using it. Um, and so people are so creative. It was literally less than a minute before people on Twitter had come up with fake U.S. Embassy accounts. One of them said, again, that I was just seeing all this happen. One of them said, um, pretending to be the U.S. government to the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, hey guys, come over for a barbecue next weekend, no booze, no pork, no girls, and stuff like this was happening. And so we have, as I'm sure you have, something called the Operations Center at the State Department that monitors what's going on around the world 24-7. And someone in the Ops Center must have said, oh my God, what is happening in Egypt? And they called the embassy in Cairo and said, what are you people doing? And um, someone explained that the ambassador had asked to have the Twitter account closed. So they said, for him's sakes, put it back up immediately. Um, so <laughs> you had this interesting situation where the ambassador um, was not wanting the government to be offended. And, and you know, in my view, that was that was the wrong priority, but that was her priority. And um, she, these, this is what she said about what was going on at that time. Saying, you know, don't have street protests, get organized, join a political party. Well, you know, there were all sorts of laws in Egypt that made it very difficult to even have a political party. Um, and she's saying, you know, street action is a bad idea. Meanwhile, in his Cairo speech, President Obama had said, we stand for universal values, including the rights of Egyptians to freedom of assembly and speech. Now, we then continued to support all the dictatorial governments, so that wasn't so great, but he did say that. Um, and compare that to what John Stewart said about Bassem Yusuf. So I think this is just one small example of something that happens all the time of, you know, kind of official uh, positions can be challenged by what's going on in the media. So then, you know, what, what values do you stand for? So uh, here are some of the lessons I think you can learn from this. Um, it's very often the traditional state-to-state -state relations can be at odds with the rapid pace of media and social media. As hard power tools, you know, when was the last time the United States won a war, uh, are less and less successful, soft power, which is less tangible and less measurable, but ultimately I think e at least as important, if not more, uh, becomes increasingly important. But to have that soft power, it's as true with Sweden as it is for the United States, um, you have to walk the walk. You have to do what you're saying. And people see it if you don't. And the, the final point I want to make about culture and diplomacy is that it is just as value, uh, valuable at as intake. It's not only something you put out, it also is a way to understand countries. Uh, and if you understand a country through its culture, you often get a very different picture than you do through its politics. In Afghanistan in March 2019, two things happened. Uh, the United States, this was under President Trump, but it continued under President Biden. Uh, began negotiations with the Taliban and excluded the Afghan government. In that same month, for the first time, 
a woman was voted, and this is by popular vote, the winner of Afghan Star, the hugely popular singing contest in Afghanistan. It used to be on one of the, they had about 70 independent media stations, the freest media in the region. And one of them um, broadcast Afghan Star. It was in its 13th season. Um, in this program, they sang Afghan songs, not American ones. It was very important in reviving Afghan music after the first Taliban regime. Uh, Afghans love their music, and this was hugely popular. Two-thirds of the population would watch the finals, and they voted the winner. Women had been voted in the finals since the show began. Uh, but this was the first time that a woman was voted the winner. She was an 18-year-old Hazara girl. That's the minority that is persecuted by the Pashto, by the Taliban, persecuted right now. Um, so that was the amazing thing about this show, it was a meritocracy. You know, you got ahead just by your own talent. In a patriarchal tribal society like Afghanistan, that is very rare. Uh, but it happened here. So I ask you, which country is it? Which country do you choose to engage with? Do you engage with the country that votes for this 18-year-old girl? Or do you engage with the terrorists? Uh, and there's all, you can see many of these contrasts. This is uh, Dr. Ahmad Sarmast, who founded the Afghan National Institute of Music uh, in Kabul. He's now located in Portugal, which gave them shelter, and he was able to escape there with about 200 members of the school. And here he is with the all-female orchestra, Zora, uh, that was one of the uh, orchestras founded by the school. Uh, this was an extraordinary place. It offered a complete liberal arts education to children ages 10 to 21. Half of them came literally from the streets, and Dr. Sarmas paid their families a dollar a day so they could go to school, which would have been what they would have earned on the streets. He was targeted by a Taliban suicide bomber in 2014. Luckily, he survived, barely. He almost lost his hearing. Uh, but he survived. So think about that. Here is this man, in, uh, a cultural leader in Afghanistan, and he is considered such a threat that the Taliban tried to kill him. So I ask you, why is it that extremists, and I would say totalitarians also, understand how important culture is. They understand that culture is what pulls people together, what gives them a sense of identity, what gives them social cohesion, what roots them. And that's exactly what extremists and totalitarians don't want, because then you can't dominate. You can't make people do what you want. So they recognize the power of culture, I think, much more than the rest of us do. Now, I'm just going to end with a couple of words about Sweden, which I put forward with hesitancy and humility, knowing I'm not an expert in this country um, at all. But I do admire your soft power. And here's just one example of a convening in Malmo of the social gastronomy movement. It seems to me two things that apply to Sweden and, and really the other Nordic countries. Great food, great cuisine, and also a social conscience about sustainability. Uh, Sweden has lots of different sources of soft power, I think. And what's interesting to me is there are things that you know might seem at odds with each other. Both your very strong profile in business and trade, but also high human development, low income e inequality, sustainable policies. And of course, the Greta effect, where here she's being arrested in The Hague of all places just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I think at this moment, as if I understand what's going on here, there's an interesting tension developing between hard and soft power in this country. And, and you know, welcome to NATO was, was a necessity that 
Sweden join, given what's going on in Europe, totally, totally understandable, but it does weaken Sweden's image as a neutral country. Um, your soft power derives from your progressive policies. So as the government tilts to the right, that erodes that soft power. The project that has brought me here, the We Hear You and 77 Messages to the Future, which opens tonight at Royal Dramaten, uh, is, I think, a perfect example of Sweden's soft power. And that has been personified for the last three years in Washington by this person, uh, Helen Pousset, Larson Pousset, who has done such a fantastic job of building partnerships and collaboration, of leveraging local voices, of connecting with young people. Everyone talks about connecting with young people. Well, Helen and Jakob really did it. And she was the mastermind together with Caitlin Cassidy, the director of the project, uh, behind this incredible concept of gathering youthful voices about climate change, each talking about their own environment, some way in which climate affects them, uh, developing the archive, which Caitlin Cassidy has put up under a climate archive. You can read all these stories. And then collaborating with Royal Dramaten to bring it to the stage here. It's, it's really an incredible project, and we owe you so much for making it happen. And an early stage of this was a presentation of some of these stories at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., in conjunction with an exhibition, Coal and Ice, where you heard some of these climate stories from these youthful voices, all of them, I would say, inspired by... Uh, Greta Thunberg. So congratulations on your very effective practice of soft power. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Cynthia, for this uh, excellent presentation and very mm -hmm. hopeful, I think. Um, so now we are uh, going to get comments from um, Carl when he's all geared up. So, Carl, do you want to sit there or stand up, yeah, perhaps? Yeah. I don't know. Thank you. Hi. Nice, nice to meet you. Uh. Thank you very much for an interesting, fascinating uh, oh. message, I would like to say. <laughs> um, uh, it's a huge one, I would also undermine. I mean, um, what you're talking about is really the, the uh, how to <coughs> promote the values behind uh, uh, political uh, decisions and mm -hmm. political positions. And of course, the Cold War <coughs> was also a war. Uh, it was no a war, really, but there were a lot of military actions. But <coughs> in fact, behind was a value conflict. Mm -hmm. That cannot be uh, underestimated. <coughs> and um, as you said, uh, the, the main, maybe the main value problem for the United States was the uh, obvious gap between these values and the actual policy of the United States. Internally, you illustrated that with racism in the United States and internationally. And that was a theme all over the years, yeah. indeed. Um, and in fact, um, um, in a way, I was uh, exposed to that. I was for nine years uh, general director of head of SIDA, which is the Swedish Agency for International Assistance. And at that time, we had quite a lot of assistance and support in Southern Africa. Oof. Not only South Africa, but the whole, uh, um, um, all the states around, which were more or less and in different ways, but basically involved in a conflict uh, with the existing former colonial regimes and, of course, the apartheid regime in South Africa. And uh, the fact was, 
when we try to support um, the movements and also the, the the people in these countries with, uh, I mean, uh, normally assistance in uh, education and uh, production and so forth and so on. Uh, we were confronted not only with the former colonial uh, powers of Europe, they were not uh, very important really, Portugal uh, had withdrawn and, and, uh, and Britain uh, and so forth, and, um, and France was not present in this, this part of, of Africa, but United States, that was the real enemy. Because uh, uh, the United States had a policy of supporting the um, authoritarian regimes, and uh, until until almost the end, mm -hmm. the apartheid regime in South Africa and uh, the apartheid regime in Namibia. So that was, of course, a problem for us because we. Can I just interrupt to say it's a big uh, a factor in changing that policy? was all the protests on campus, college exactly. campuses. That's exactly. So uh, you are quite tuned. right. <laughs> that, that, but they took some time, I yeah. would say. Yeah. Uh, and unnecessary. Uh, but I mean, that was um, an obvious conflict for Indeed. us. We, 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 we understood, of course, and uh, to put it mildly, appreciated the enormous impact, important impact United States have had in Europe, in Western Europe, and in fact saved Western mm. Europe, not from the Nazis, but from the Soviets. <laughs> the Nazis were more or less taken care of by the uh, <laughs> Soviet Union. But the, it, uh, yes, well, I, it's we uh, exaggeration. But that. anyway. Uh, My father fought in that yeah. war. But anyway, but, but let's anyway, go on. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the thing was that the um, United States at that time, in the end of the 40s, had a very progressive policy, indeed. Uh, and um, I, I will take a very small example. You knew that, of course, but I don't think uh, you here know it. But uh, this is a very small thing in the field of arts, real arts. The, thi uh, the new founded uh, uh, CIA was at that time not only engaged in in uh, uh, in fogs and, and spice and you know all that. Wow, they kind. did a lot of culture. They they were uh, engaged in in supporting arts mm -hmm. and not any specific. Yes, indeed, they supported abstract art. Mm -hmm. And why? Because uh, in the uh, first the, the uh, Soviet soon then the uh, GDR, they had a typically social realistic art movement mm -hmm. in the West and in West Germany specifically. All the artists, all the and uh, of course writers and so forth, they they had a problem how to start again after the Nazi year, how to can you a at all express anything important? By art, and and that was all, all the uh, the the main theme for many um, for many intellectuals, uh, and as you know, the the famous uh, statement by Adorno: "It's impossible to write a poem after Auschwitz." Mm -hmm. But they started then finding a new way of abstract art, and. CIA understood at that time that to s support that could be a part of creating an, uh, an alternative to the uh, social realism of, 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 of the, uh, the, the, the uh, of a communist pattern. And they did, and successfully. That was one reason why abstract art was so popular rather early in the United States. And that was also behind many of these uh, artists, which are nowadays uh, really world famous. I would especially mention Gerard Richter, mm -hmm. who was who still, uh, I think he is uh, on the top of the list of, uh, uh, of the uh, and the auctions when it comes to the prices, and, and uh, a great artist. He didn't know that the 
partner that came to him at that time came from CIA. No one knows that. And also the, the, the um, intellectual uh, quarterly encounter, which was uh, a, a really very important intellectual uh, quarterly, and uh, that was also funded by CIA and other activities yeah. in the same direction. And I, I take that example just to, s to, to underline that if you would like to um, support your values, you must, uh, you must really take, uh, uh, thi uh, take up things which are not uh, uh, necessarily uh, a, a, a thing you c could understand as an important thing in this context. So I think that is uh, it underlines what you said that uh, this is a this is a, a, a field which has not until now uh, been uh, enough uh, uh, observed. Now I would say today the field is of course t totally different because there are so many uh, directions. I don't think you can talk about one story which is owned by one mm -hmm. power. Uh, there are many stories around and uh, of course um, uh, the um, more or less totalitarian regimes, they have always been in that business of course to try to promote what they think is the important thing and, uh, by various means and we see that uh, daily. Uh, in, in, in in the Western countries and and the United States, it's much more um, uh, diversity, and you cannot regulate. Uh, you should not regulate that diversity. That's uh, that is a part of the idea of, of uh, democratic uh, uh, value. So, so th this diversity is um, uh, necessary and important, but th it means also that it's extremely different, uh, difficult, I think, to, uh, to have a kind of, of um, uh, uh, accepted uh, policy from governments when it comes to this kind of uh, activities. Thank you, Carl. Do you want to respond? Um, well, thanks so much. You raised a lot of really interesting points. I'll just pick up on one very shortly. I always feel so conflicted about that whole CIA thing because, you know, although it's absolutely correct, what you say, absolutely correct. Not true for the rock musicians, as far as we know. They weren't involved with that, or the, or the jazz musicians, but absolutely correct for abstract art. So you do have this bizarre scenario of a misogynistic alcoholic eventually suicidal uh, Jackson Pollock for example representing uh, the United States but just the same way as rock music literally got people out of their seats and um, feeling free abstract expressionism did the same thing um, so I've always felt ambivalent about it because on the one hand it's obviously not good to have cultural outreach through a secret spy agency. That is a bit of a contradiction. That is not the best way. In <laughs> terms. But here's why I feel conflicted. At that point, people recognized how important culture was. And the CIA had a ton of money mm. and they spent it on culture. Another super smart, and they're smart. Those people are smart. Um, they still are. Um, another amazing thing they did was to have Dr. Zhivago published. They, together with European partners, sought out Boris Pasternak, the leading so Russian poet in his little dacha in the middle of nowhere. He produced a manuscript, the one copy, there were typewriters in those days, and said, yes, you can have it, take it and publish it. And they had it published not just in English, French, German, and all of that. They had it published in Russian and snuck it back into the Soviet Union. There was this amazing scheme where they passed it out at the Brussels World's Fair. I mean, you cannot make this stuff up. The headquarters was the Vatican Pavilion. And they hired Russian speakers to go around the grounds and listen. And for anyone who was speaking Russian, they would whisper to them, which seems to me a kind of risky thing, but anyway, they did it. Would you like a copy of Dr. Zhivago? 
And if they said yes, they were led back to the Vatican Pavilion and given a book in a paper bag. I mean, who else but the CIA would dream that up? It's amazing. <laughs> but but to go back to one of the points I made, they understood about leveraging local voices. They weren't passing out copies of the U.S. Constitution, um, you know, or any of our novels. They were giving to Russians their greatest living writer who was censored by their government. Pretty ingenious. That, that could be a movie, I guess, or yeah. will be eventually. Yeah, it's all, we know all this now because the 50 years is up, right. so all the documents are... Yeah, could, there's could, a great book about it, so all the documents are public now. Could I interrupt your exchange with a question of my own? I mean, I wonder, what do you think, or could you elaborate on this? What, what, what does it take for soft power to work? I mean, I, I guess it has to do with features of the context, and you mentioned yourself, Gorbachev and the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall, and, and perhaps if, if Putin had been in charge, he, he would have shot the uh, people who listened to the music and, and so on. So how, how can it made, be made to work in the case of people like Putin, for example? Could you... What does it take? Um, <laughs> I think we've seen if, if leaders are, uh, I'll give you two answers. One, if, if leaders are willing just to kill anyone who opposes them, it's hopeless. Then it's, you know, look mm. what happened in Syria. Mm. Uh, the only thing that can make a difference, uh, it, it happened in Egypt too, you know, uh, I mean, you can hardly as the entire Arab world is up in arms saying we want dignity is actually what they said. They didn't say we want democracy. They didn't want elections. They have elections and total farce. They wanted the capacity to be able to support their themselves and their families in an equitable society. That's what they were looking for, which is much more difficult than holding an election. But as long as their leaders are willing to just shoot them, and as long as other leaders, like the United States in particular, will support who whatever leader emerges, and I, the alternative is not so obvious. You know, do we go say, oh, no, no, you're, you be president instead of this person. It's, it's a much longer, more difficult process of really growing a meritocratic society, sporting it from the bottom up. So it's not like, oh, we should have done this, you know, on that date. It's a much longer, more difficult process. But as long as the rulers are, are willing to kill their people, there's, I don't think, not much you can do. But I would also say soft power is working. I mean, look at the example of Basim Yusuf. Mm. But then it takes leaders, not just the United States, uh, it takes leaders all over the world to recognize that and support the movements that emerge. And not just you know, say, oh, soft power, that's nice. But meanwhile, our strategic interests, such a deadly term, our strategic interests say that, you know, we need to ally with this person or that person. And the image I showed on my very first sli slide of Jan Karski, he was the first uh, eyewitness of the Holocaust uh, to speak to President Roosevelt. He was a Polish Catholic who was taken inside the Warsaw uh, ghetto and into a death camp by Jewish leaders in Poland. And they said, you, you're, going to, you're being sent as an emissary to London and Washington. You have to see this so that people will believe you. He did. He went to London. Churchill, Anthony Eden, wouldn't let him see Churchill. He said, we know this. We know this. We don't need to hear from you. He did see President Roosevelt, and he did tell him what he saw, and he said in the winter of 1943, if you don't do something right now, all the Jews in Poland will be killed. And President Roosevelt talked about strategic interests. He said, thank you for coming to see me. We will win this war, and when we do, all the criminals will be killed. 
and both things happened. All the Jews in Poland were killed. Uh, not the criminals wouldn't be killed, they'd be punished. Um, the, all the Jews in Poland were killed. We did win the war, and the criminals were to some degree punished. But the assumption was then by President Roosevelt, and I don't think it's changed much now, uh, you can't do both. You know, this, this is our long-term goal, and it'll be good for everyone, and we really can't worry about what's happening to people along the way. And I think soft power will only be <sighs> more dominant in the world when leaders start worrying about what's happening to people along the way. Mm, thank you. Uh, I, I do want to give uh, the rest of the audience some r room for questions. But Carl, do you, do you have some brief uh, thing that you want to add, or shall I? Well, um, uh, yes. Uh, I, I just would like to add a few points uh, since you talked about Sweden uh, and, and your co comments about Sweden. Um, uh, of course, it's true um, um, that we had a, a, a somewhat, as a small country, somewhat specific uh, position, uh, and that made it easy for us to, to work also with uh, culture and um, values in our assistance. And uh, the important thing with that was that it created a kind of uh, uh, a rather strong cooperation between uh, various d groups of Swedish artists in many fields and people in the countries where we worked, in, uh, specifically in Africa. And that uh, also created a, a kind of understanding in Sweden when it comes to uh, the situation of these countries and, and they created uh, social contacts. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that was a, a way of, of working which was rather successful. Now it's all gone. Uh, and uh, uh, everything mm. is, uh, has been closed, uh, so there is nothing of that sort anymore. And of course, the position of Sweden has changed uh, significantly. Uh, it's not more, I must tell you that, it's not more a good governance country. Uh, and uh, and uh, it is certainly not neutral. Uh, no, so that so that it's a it. enormous difference. Well, I think neutrality is overrated. I don't <laughs> <know>. <laughs> <laughs> I regret that so much, but but good governance is not. And I've I've experienced that in Egypt. Actually, seen the very good work yeah. that Sweden did there during the yeah. revolution. Yeah. Really, yes, yes. really yes. extraordinary. Yes. And yes. what a loss! And how short-sighted. Because I'm sorry, Sweden is never going to be like a great military yeah. power. Yeah. Where where are you going <laughs> to lead from? Yep. I, you know. Very short-sighted. And on that note, I think we should thank Cynthia and Carl for this fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I do have, I left them, I'm going to go grab them because I really don't want to take them back to Washington. I have some information about the Laboratory for Global Performance and Politics, which I'll quickly bring and leave on a chair, and you're welcome to take with you. <laughs>